Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's now my very great pleasure to introduce uh, Peter Sutherland. Uh, I've been very lucky in that I've known and worked with Peter Sutherland for a very long time. I first knew him when he was a very young Attorney General. He afterwards went on to become a, our Commissioner in Europe. And I think something that's not said often enough, and it's never said in Britain, about the influence of individual Britons, individual English people in particular in Brussels, that an individual from a particular country or from any country can actually make a huge influence in Brussels. When Peter Sutherland was our commissioner, he was responsible for the changes in legislation which allowed competition on European air routes and which led, for example, to Irish success stories like Ryanair. He was also responsible for what has become the Erasmus programme, which has enabled youngsters in universities all over Europe to spend a year or whatever in another university. Uh, and I think we in this country, and people actually all over Europe, owe Peter Sutherland a great deal of thanks uh, for those achievements. Since then, he went on to do other things, as we know. He went to the GATT. He negotiated the, um, the origins of the World Trade Organization, the WTO, which unfortunately has not done much work since he left. Uh, he went to work with Goldman, Goldman Sachs, Allied Irish Banks, and now he's um, the UN Secretary General Special Representative for Migration. So it is a great, great pleasure for me to introduce Peter Sutherland. Thanks, Sahi. <coughs> Well, first of all, let me say that it's uh, a pleasure to be here. Um, I say that genuinely, and I've said the same thing before about I IIEA. I think it fills a vital niche in Irish life. It allows for real debate on real issues of great importance, and obviously the subject of today's discussion is a classic of its kind. But the contributions that have been made since the foundation, I'm glad to see Brendan here, have been considerable. And it's a pleasure, therefore, for me to be here with you. Um, I'm going to reflect for a couple of minutes a little more broadly than on the direct impact of Brexit were it, were it to occur. Because I want to preface my remarks by a couple of comments about Britain's attitude to Europe and the distinction that can be drawn between that and our own. Because that distinction may well play a part in any subsequent negotiations after Article 50 is invoked, if the Brexit referendum actually takes place. I do so with great sympathy for the United Kingdom, for which I have considerable respect and where Irishmen have been treated well. I was chairman for a time, 13 years, of BP. I remember when I was asked, I was a bit taken aback, not merely by the fact that they hadn't obviously recognised the incompetence that they were endowing themselves with, but by the fact that an Irishman was, at the time, their biggest company becoming its chairman. I never heard a reflection in all the time that I was there on my provenance, which I've always proclaimed with some pride. And I admire Britain in many respects. We've had our vicissitudes in the past, but it has been a haven of democracy. It has stood for the rule of law. It has been a vital part of the continent of which we are all members. And I deeply hope for both utilitarian reasons and for matters of principle that Britain remains part of the European Union. But that does not blind me to the fact that Britain has a very, very different attitude to European integration to the one that I dearly hold myself and which is shared by, I think, most of my countrymen. I remember once reading Lord Canning saying, 
1827, when he was Prime Minister of Britain, and the collapse of the uh, Concert of Europe, as it was called, uh, was taking place, which was an attempt to create a structure between European countries to avoid wars and create harmony and rules and so on, the kind of, that came out of the Congress of Vienna. And he said, uh, and it always stuck in my mind, the quotation, let's celebrate, he said, the collapse of the Congress of Vienna. He said, from now on, every, every nation for itself and God for us all. Now, he should have said, and God help us all, because what was to come was, of course, a century of the most dreadful pain and suffering. Uh, but it was um, a reversal to a world of balance of power. And balance of power has always been, understandably, part of British foreign policy, that you should never have any one European state, and there's a logic to this, with great power because it inevitably leads to conflict. So Britain's foreign policy for centuries has been balancing power in Europe. And that attitude and an attitude to national sovereignty in Britain is entirely understandable in the context of a country which for a thousand years has not been invaded, which sees understandably with the terror, terrible acts that have been perpetrated on the continent most recently by Hitler and Stalin, uh, a threat on the other part of Europe for which they do not wish to be, they don't wish to be implicated in it and they wish to remain a part. And this is part of the psyche. Maybe it goes back some of it to the Reformation. But whatever the causes, there is a different attitude which has been reflected in Eurobarometer polls since Eurobarometer polls started to European integration in Britain. We, on the other hand, have a totally different approach, and partially because of our relationship with Britain, as Tom Kettle, that great Irish patriot who died in Flanders, put it to be truly Irish, you have to be, we, we will have to be European first. And in a way, and I don't say this in a disparaging sense, it was to escape the economic straitjacket that a relationship which was entirely virtually based on economic relations with Britain had created for us and the difficulties that this included, even under Anglo-Irish trade agreements for our agriculture as well as everything else, that from the date of our inception as a state to the date of our uh, 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 accession to the European Union, we were tied with an umbilical cord that was not always comfortable to the United Kingdom. So Europe, a big part of Europe, particularly as a small country, sharing in sovereignty with big countries, having our Prime Minister having the opportunity to Week almost a week and meet almost on a weekly basis with the Chancellor of Germany or whatever was not really a heady experience, but it changed attitudes. So attitudes here are different, and they're reflected in policies. And I hope our policy of favouring ongoing European integration remains part of what we believe in. And if that means, on occasion, saying uncomfortable things to our great friends in the United Kingdom, or taking positions which are not the same as theirs, then we must do it. We must not reside from a commitment which is vital to the future of our country, which is Europe. A Europe that's going through turbulence, which is so extreme, caused by the financial crisis, the so-called austerity, the Greek problem, the immigration problem, the rise of racist and xenophobic parties all over Europe, the 
increase of nationalism of a virulent kind in parties all over Europe. The great English European, Geoffrey Howe, said that Europe was, that the European Union and integration process was a mechanism for taming sovereignty, as a taming nationalism. And I, I agree with that. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> And anyone who is unfortunate enough to have to read some of the tabloids in Britain uh, occasionally, let alone regularly, will see the outburst of this virulence in much of this Brexit debate, not just in Britain but in other places. So it's worrying. The other quote I want to uh, give to you uh, allegedly was made by a senior representative, the most senior representative of Britain in Messina when the treaty was being created. Now that has been questioned. Somebody else said that it was actually in Val du Chess in Brussels that this was a, uh, was, a, was a place to be settled, but it's still relevant. He said, Monsieur, I have followed your work with interest and sympathetically I have to tell you that the future treaty which you are discussing a. Has no chance of being agreed. B. If it were to be agreed, it would have no chance of being ratified. C. If it were to be ratified, you would have no chance of being, being applied. And please note that if it were applied, it would be totally unacceptable to Britain. You speak of agriculture, which we don't like, of power over customs, to which we take exception, of institutions which horrify us. Monsieur le Président, Monsieur, au revoir et bonne chance. And he stood up and walked out. <laughs> and and maybe, maybe, maybe it's an example of the debate which we're now having. Um, the second prefatory remark that I would make is this. Like everybody else, um, with any degree of uh, remote humility, I have to admit I haven't a clue what way the uh, referendum is going to work out. <coughs> the opinion poll suggestions would be very close. The bookies seem to think still it seems to have gone up, back up today to 1730 or something that it would be fine. But if you speak to the average taxi driver, you're certain that they're already half out. Um, so I have no idea what the result would be. The most one can say is that we're living in a time of terrible risk. And I'm therefore just going to concentrate on something which has already probably been fully covered here. And anyone who's bored stiff with the subject, which you would be very wise to be, uh, please feel free to leave uh, halfway through my speech. But I'm going to talk about what I think will happen after a decision is taken on Brexit. On balance today, and I'm manic depressive on this, uh, on balance today I think Britain actually would probably stay. Because when you get somebody for whom I have so little regard as Farage making a statement <coughs> that we'll continue the fight after we lose, you begin to think maybe he really is beginning to lose. And when you get some other politicians with names which um, certainly reflect uh, reputations which have not been helped by their absurd utterances, such as those of Boris uh, Johnson and his ridiculous uh, connection between European integration and the actions of Hitler. However, however he may have couched it, you begin to wonder about <coughs> how anyone is likely to be led by such meanderings. And of course, he's not alone in that, but they, the meanderings are virtually all, in my opinion, on one side rather than the other. When a decision to withdraw is taken, and I'm going back to my Attorney General time, which is so long ago that it may be an imperfect legal construction, <laughs> it seems to me <coughs> inevitable that Britain is going to be faced with 
and Ireland with the consequences of a very prolonged period of negotiation. I was involved as director, as, as, as Dahi said, as director general of GATT and then the first director general of the WTO in the most complicated trade negotiation ever. So I think I, think I can claim that I know a little bit about trade negotiation. And what is going to happen after a decision is notified, which Cameron has already said he would do immediately. Incidentally, there is no legal requirement to notify the day after a referendum that a decision has been taken to leave. Uh, it could be that the sanction of Parliament delays could delay that. But he has said, and it seems to me to be politically wise, that if the people speak, you respond by doing what the people have asked. So once the notification of departure is given, we move into a situation of uncertainty. An uncertainty which is profound as to what will happen next. The Council of 27 remaining members of the European Union will then have to, by consensus, which can be interpreted as unanimity, agree the guidelines for the Commission in a negotiation which will follow with the United Kingdom as to how the relationship will take place following withdrawal. Article 50, as no doubt has already been said today, has a finite two-year period during which negotiations <laughs> take place. It can be extended, but only, again, with unanimity. This puts the United Kingdom in negotiating terms in an extreme situation of vulnerability. If, for an example, negotiations which will be highly complicated <clears throat> about how the relationship might exist after Brexit take anything like the sort of period that past experiences might dictate would be likely, I think you're talking about periods significantly in excess of five years. But nobody can tell that if one side capitulated up to the desires of the other, obviously it could be very much more rapid. But one can only look at the difficulties of the negotiation and the different subjects, which I'll shortly touch on, that uh, to come to the conclusion that the likelihood is that it will be a very prolonged period. And I may indeed be very uh, optimistic in suggesting the number of years that I did. It could be significantly more than that. The minute that decision to withdraw is taken, and the minute the negotiations therefore begin, the entire economic prospect of the United Kingdom in the short term <coughs> and inward investment in Europe will change. This is the fifth biggest economy in the world. It is in a situation where it has been advised by the IMF, the OECD, the Governor of the Bank of England, the uh, President of the United States, and every objective observer and every head of government that has spoken on the subject that this would be a disastrous decision. On the other side, you've Boris Johnson, Lord Lamont, Lord Lawson, and a number of others. I know which way I would vote. <laughs> but the bottom line is that the conclusions of those who have carefully researched this is that the immediate effect of the uncertainty before we even get to the probable outcome of negotiations will be devastating. 
it will also have very serious effects on its closest trading partners. The most important of them, and not just on one side, is Ireland. Because obviously there will be concern about the access to the British market that will be available at the end of the negotiations. I think myself that we can be sure of one thing. A drawbridge is not going to be pulled up <clears throat> to stop trade between European countries and the, the United Kingdom <coughs> overnight. But the conditions under which the trade will be conducted in the future <coughs> may well alter as a result of the negotiations. And the uncertainty about those conditions are important. It also may well be the case that in the financial services sector, the conclusion will be reached, may already have been reached, that financial services and the operation of the single passport is unlikely to be part of any final solution and that therefore the conclusion might be that the location of financial sector participants, whether it be in banking, investment banking, insurance or fund management, will be deeply concerned with the prospect of a prolonged negotiation with very serious potential for not for the non-inclusion in any related internal market condition that may exist after the negotiations with, between the United Kingdom and Britain. In the meantime, the United Kingdom, which, like ourselves, would have virtually abolished its, its internal trade negotiation capacity because all trade negotiations have been conducted on their behalf by the European Union since joining the European Union, will be scurrying to try to create, in an independent sense, a negotiated trade agreement with the 60-plus free trade agreement partners that the European Union has and which Britain will lose as soon as it leaves the uh, European Union. This is an absolutely formidable challenge. A formidable challenge for which one must, even allowing for the great repute and justified reputation of the British Civil Service, be very concerned about the capacity to link into and to deal with the challenge that it presents. Now, <clears throat> the result of all of this is that according to, I think, the best paper on this matter, <coughs> which has been uh, written by Pyrrhus, the former head of the um, Council Legal Service, there are seven <coughs> different alternatives for Britain in the negotiations which will take place. One, some of them are, are of less importance, of importance in my view than others. But the main ones, I think probably are the Norwegian model. The Norwegian model, which is the EEA, will require the United Kingdom to accept and apply all of the regulation of the European Union, including its competition policy and all of the uh, acquis communautaire in regard to goods. It will require Britain to accept the principle of free movement of people and it will require Britain to contribute to the budget of the European Union more or less in a sum equivalent to what it contributes today. Well, <clears throat> when that deal is brought back to Westminster, if that were to be the route that is taken, 
one might imagine that some of the political reaction might be, what's this all about? We've done now and agreed to now everything that we were complaining about and telling people to vote against in the Brexit referendum. What will Parliament do? On the other hand, you could say that today the British Parliament, if you were to take the Labour Party at face value, and I remember Ed Miliband giving me a, a statistic which was overwhelming, and it was over 90% of his members, he told me were firmly in, fav in, view, in favour of staying in. If you were to take all of them <coughs> at the half of the uh, Parliamentary Conservative Party who would want to stay in almost at any cost, there's an overwhelming majority who don't want Brexit in a parliament which will have to ratif ratify whatever deal is done. One can foresee chaos in this situation and severe political trauma in the United Kingdom. The second alternative that is generally referred to as being viable is the Swiss alternative. The idea of rejoining what Britain, after all, created, EFTA. And <clears throat> here again, the relationship with Switzerland is in a very bad place at the moment between the EU and uh, Switzerland because the Swiss were obliged to allow free movement of people and recently had a referendum that restricted that free movement. The European Union is now talking about their reaction to this and how this is incompatible with the relationship that exists between Switzerland and the European Union and their access to the internal market. Again, Switzerland makes a substantial contribution to the budget of the European Union. Again, Switzerland, for access to the internal market, is obliged to apply the regulatory framework that is applicable to the members of the European Union. Again, this model, which is produced regularly, or was, until its uh, failings became increasingly evident, even in an appallingly unsophisticated debate conducted in the British media, it's clear that this will result in a position which is a contradiction of the very decision that the majority of the British people will have taken in a referendum if they decide in favour of Brexit. So, it, also, it will not include financial services. The, 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 the Brexit types make the case that Britain receives more exports than to the European Union than go the other way. And therefore, Germany has an overwhelming interest, for an example, in maintaining an open free market. And undoubtedly, Germany does want, and we all want, an opening a free market. But the other side of that debate is, re is not referred to in these comments. And the other side of the debate is that Britain exports substantially greater services, particular financial services, than it takes from others. Its economy is significantly based on financial services and services more generally. These will be excluded on the models that we're talking about as they will be excluded if a third route, which some say is simply rely on WTO routes, rely on the WTO. 
Well, reliance on the WTO is fine in terms of aspects of tariff policy and some but not all aspects of non-tariff policy, but does not work to cover services. And in my opinion, services are going to be a key in this negotiation. What effect is this going to have on commerce, on investment? Well, it can have both negative effects and positive effects. Amongst the positive effects, from an Irish point of view, is that the financial services sector is going to be under such challenge if Britain leaves Europe that it is certainly going to see how it can accommodate its position in a member state that is part of the Union rather than being outside it. I'm not saying that Ireland would be first in the list of choices, but there are very different and numerous aspects of the financial services sector. And <clears throat> there's no doubt that the fear that financial services will lose out, which on most scenarios it most definitely will, <coughs> must have a serious impact. So we have a series of different approaches. Some say we can join a customs union like Turkey, or we can have a free trade agreement like the one that has just been conducted with Canada by the European Union. Incidentally, an agreement which excludes services, as indeed is the case with the Turkish situation. There's no doubt, therefore, in my mind, that the high probability, and nobody can say anything with certainty on this, in regard to a negotiation without precedent, is that it will be impossible to simply ditch the requirements of free movement of people, application of the regulatory laws of the European Union, of which you are not a member and therefore cannot, interpret, uh, cannot, cannot influence, or make financial contributions. All of them are very likely to be required in the context of whatever new relationship may develop subsequent to Brexit. I say that recognising that there will be a great deal of support, including from this country, to finding a way for Britain to maintain its economic relations with us and with other parts of Europe. <coughs> but to do so at the price of destroying the essence of membership, to take a step which would create not merely a Europe a la carte, but a Europe which is implicitly disintegrating before your eyes, where you can be a member of the European single market without being a member of the European Union, is, in my view, inconceivable. I don't believe that it can, it can happen. In fact, the fear of the precedent factor that may result from a company, a country, leaving the European Union at a time of such turbulence in the internal management of the European Union may well influence a situation <coughs> which the Minister for Finance <coughs> in France last week made clear. Negotiations are not going to be easy. 
we're not just simply going to wave goodbye to a member of the European Union on the basis that there is no price to being out of the Union but enjoying all of the benefits of being part of its single market. So we're faced in Ireland, and really I think I'm not one of those who believes that in the end of the day, although it is possible that the negotiations would be so terrible that we will end up with physical, a physical border again being erected between the Republic and Northern Ireland. I don't believe that that will happen, but on one of, and he indeed he refers to it in his paper, on one of Pyrrhus's hypotheses, that could be a result. <clears throat> I don't think it will happen. I think that a way will be found. But I do think that what is happening here is something which is deeply damaging to Ireland North and South. I'm amazed that one political party in Northern Ireland is so uh, imbued with a, a sense of um, exceptionalism that it is in favour, apparently, of Brexit. It will be devastating to whole sectors of the community, both in Northern Ireland, um, in Northern Ireland in particular, and whilst there may be advantages on, in terms of foreign direct investment here, I certainly don't balance them in any way against the huge uncertainties and damage that those uncertainties will bring if we have this very prolonged period of negotiation with Britain. So the outlook at the moment... Is, is deeply worrying. As I've said, no matter what the vicissitudes of our history with Britain, we have a huge interest in Britain remaining in the European Union. And not just, and not just because they're our biggest trading partner, they also have a similar attitude to globalisation and opening of trade opportunities which are essential to our inward investment flow. They were the most supportive of all the states that I remember during the period when I was in the WTO when we were trying to create it. The United Kingdom, John Major at the time, was immensely supportive. And governments of left and right have always taken that position in favour of trade in Britain. So we have that common interest. They have been responsible for our not being part of, of Schengen, something I regret. I wish we were in Schengen. I don't agree with our opting out of anything, but I can understand that the common travel area with Britain is an important part of the life of our country in a way which made that decision an extremely difficult one. How it could have been accommodated, I'm not going to go into now. So... <coughs> Where do, we, where do we lie? We lie in a situation where the evidence is overwhelmingly in favour of Britain taking the decision to remain in the, the European Union. The case has not been explored in a manner which I would have expected and articulated in a way which is clear in the United Kingdom. And admittedly, while I've been talking about the intricacies of trade policy, <coughs> is a particularly opaque subject. But as every independent commentator has come to the same conclusion about it, how could one come to a different one? with a wave of an imperious wand saying that there'd be no problem, we'll get everything we want as soon as we decide to leave. It's just utterly unreal. The UK accounted for 2.7% of the world's export of goods last year. Let's not exaggerate. 
the clout that that gives the United Kingdom in its negotiation, either with the European Union or the 60 other countries whose special relations it will lose as a result of the European Union um, bilateral agreements being withdrawn from its purview. It has 6.8% of the world's services in 2014. That compares to 26% for the European Union as a whole in terms of services and 14.9% in terms of goods. The negotiating position of Europe, whether it be in transatlantic trade agreements or in any other trade agreements, is infinitely stronger than that which Britain alone will hold when it now has to recreate its negotiating position with the rest of the world. It's clear that half, well, first of all, three quarters on the last survey I've seen of foreign direct investors into Britain went into Britain on the basis of the access which it gave to them to the European Union. Three quarters. Half percent, half, half of the total value of UK equity markets are owned by non-UK entities. These are investing in a country based on that country's involvement in the European Union. No wonder that sterling dives even when Boris announced, announced that he was going to be running on the Brexit side. If that can shake sterling, imagine what might shake such sterling in the event of a decision being taken. Imagine the disruption that this will have in terms of competitive advantage when, in fact, you end up in a situation which will obviously immediately impact us in terms of the sale of goods and services. <coughs> so I've nothing to say that is remotely constructive about the possibility of Brexit. I'm absolutely convinced that Ireland's interest, if Brexit were to occur, I can't even believe that anyone could believe that it would be in our interest to leave the European Union. Quite the reverse. We should bind ourselves even more strongly to it. And the thought of recreating past relationships and recreating uh, any form of dependency on any one economy would be absolutely wrong to us for us. Uh, I'm not saying, however, in terms of the old Irish refrain, thank God we're surrounded by water. <laughs> Nobody's surrounded by water anymore. <clears throat> we need Britain in. I remember years ago being amazed in the Sunday Independent poll, which said, when asked the question, who are your favourite people? We said, not the British, we said the English not the Americans, not anybody else. And I think the average Englishman and the average Irishman get along very well. And I hope that we continue to do so in the fellowship of what I believe to be a noble undertaking, namely the integration of people whilst maintaining our own individual identities within the European Union, which has brought us to a stage at least where our dependence is not exclusive, as it was for so long. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. I think Peter is willing to take a few questions. If there are any. Uh, Ronan Tynan. Um, Good to see you again, Peter. First, I must begin by congratulating you on the sterling work you're doing as the UN Special Representative of Migration. I mean, it is one of the big moral issues of our time, and uh, you certainly have done the nation, and indeed Europe, some service in that role, so thank you very much. Um, 
Just in relation to this, I'm based in London myself, and thankfully I will have a vote in the upcoming uh, <laughs> referendum. But the one thing that does perturb me, having attended quite a few debates, most recently in the London School of Economics as well, is that you never get a full-blooded, positive, from an economics point of view, because obviously politically it's not on in Britain, about the benefits of the European Union to the United Kingdom. For example, you made the point about services. 78% UK economy, 73 in the European Union, only a quarter of intra-EU trade is based on services. So potentially it suggests that Britain, if Cameron get, got the single market, he did get in his agreement that there would be an attempt to achieve the single market services, which is on the way, the UK would gain 7%. You made the point about the surplus in the city, 19 billion exports, only imports 3 billion. I mean, it's a stunning economic success and how Brexiteers get away with this constantly putting down the British economy, suggesting Britain is almost this poor, you know, uh, almost irrelevant state with, instead of the powerhouse and dominant power that it is. And I'm just going to finish on this thing because you're an expert on non-tariff barriers and it's something I'm constantly trying to bring home to people because it came home very forcefully during John Major's premiership when the European Union issued a directive on the decibel levels of lawnmowers. And this produced an explosion of criticism in Britain. Ministers were doorstepped and they even began demanding an inquiry until it was discovered that Whitehall Mandarins had not only agreed to it, they'd actually written that actual directive because the Germans had introduced, had virtually silenced their lawnmowers and this posed a, a lethal threat to, to the British lawnmower making industry but almost silently, with no fanfare, no publicity, until it became discovered that the Commission published it, they had completely reversed it by getting an agreement to the decibel level which protected British lawnmower makers. I'm sorry for going on a bit about that now, but once again, <laughs> once again, we see the powerhouse Brits achieving amazing success they never get credit for. And it's this, this <coughs> amazingly, almost a secret, positive story that never gets told. Thank you. Uh, well, all I can say is that it never will be told. Um, uh, the reality is that people switch off when you get into the key economic issues. This is an emotional issue fed by decades of misreporting, stories without foundation about straight bananas, uh, which I think emanated from one of the people that I've been referring to fairly constantly. He's now talking about having to sell bananas in groups of three or something, something that Heseltine uh, attacked him on the <coughs> television for. You can't win in this. If you have, as you have with a significant uh, group of the tabloid media and two, at least, of the broadsheet media in Britain, a visceral presentation of every issue in emotional nationalist terms rather than logical terms, there's no way that the debate will be conducted in a manner which is other than a straightforward emotional reaction. The result is that the vote that is anticipated people are very worried that young people won't vote because young people would vote to stay in, that old people will vote and old people will want to go because they are sold on a past. One famous um, British commentator who is unfortunately dead because he'd have helped in this argument, Hugo Young, made the famous comment that the problem with the UK was reconciling a past that it cannot forget with a future that it cannot avoid. <laughs> and I think that that's spot on. But we all have a touch of that uh, about us. Um, but unfortunately, in the presentation of this in Britain, there's been too much of that and too little of the obvious logic. But the obvious logic is unfortunately around complicated things like those which I was trying to talk about. And you're never going to be able to sell that politically. People aren't interested. They're interested in flags, the noise of uh, lawnmowers, etc. All, if it goes to prove their visceral dislike <coughs> of government in Brussels, which of course itself is a ridiculous simplicity. Yep. Thank you. I've got one over here first, if I may. Over here. 
and then I go to Gillespie always gets preference oh, in the Soviet Union. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Paul Gillespie he had, from he the had Institute. His first uh, I was very interested in your introductory remarks about the relationship between Britain and Ireland in the European setting. And you invoke what I would call the power question, the power, the relationship of dependence, which you finished on as well. In my view, that's a power question. And the balance of power, if you like, between Britain and Ireland shifted uh, with Europeanization very much to Ireland's advantage, putting it in that much more multilateral setting. What seems to be, in the event of a Brexit, uh, there is the danger from the Irish point of view of re-establishing that relationship of power rather than of interdependence and negotiated interdependence with Britain. There would be many of the pressures of scale, many of the pressures of economics and <coughs> politics, including the pressures running through Northern Ireland and unionism, to draw us back towards that, that orbit. One temptation would be to be very soft in the negotiation of the Brexit uh, 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 um, uh, transition. Uh, particularly in the short term, as against the, longer, uh, uh, as against the longer term need to put, if necessary, in a very hard-nosed way, Britain through the political trauma you described that would arise from the contradictory outcomes of the decision. Uh, and the Irish policy dilemma would be whether to hold out for that five-year transition going through that trauma, let them go <coughs> through the trauma they need to go through in Hugo Rung, Young's terms, if you like, which could include risking their breakup of their own political system. We, that also has huge impacts on us. Uh, so we are, I just wanted to, the question is, to, that to, to, what would your comment be about Irish policy hard-nosed as against soft-nosed going through this transition? if the objective is towards a somewhat deeper uh, European Union to hold itself together, to hold the euro together, but also bearing in mind that in order to do that, it may be necessary to have regard to those who have lost out to globalization around the system, including in Britain, the people who've been left behind by these recent economic changes, so that a deeper union would have to be, in my view, to gain legitimacy, a more social union. Well, the sting in the tail of your question would open up um, a major debate. The earlier part of your question was really precisely the point that I was, was raising at the beginning and end of what I was saying. Uh, I won't go down, not because I, I wouldn't like to, I won't go down the road about social policy and how we should develop that because it's, uh, it's too big to try to handle. I believe so passionately, both individually and as an Irishman, in the vital importance of European integration, that there can be no compromise on the support of any position that the United Kingdom might take in negotiations, which fundamentally undermines that Therefore, in the negotiations on free movement before the renegotiation concluded, I certainly said, and publicly, that we couldn't compromise on that. And therefore, I think our position, we have a natural sympathy, which I think is good and understandable for Britain. I think this is a question of classic diplomacy. We have to stand absolutely firm and not be afraid to say it on basic principles of the European Union and in regard to the Brexit negotiation to be prepared to stand on that even if it is inconvenient for our friends. At the same time, where that is not the case, we should try, of course, to be helpful. But as I tried to say... Europe is the fundamental issue for Irish foreign policy and the support of Europe is key. If this Brexit negotiation is to in any way undermine that, then our position has to be one which is independent and uh, sometimes inconvenient to, to, our, to our relationship with the UK. But I hope that doesn't happen. Thank yes. you. This will have to be the last one.
Uh, Mr. Sutherland, my name is Bob Hanna, and first of all, I'd like to thank you for your wide-ranging and reasoned analysis. I promise you a short question. Um, my question relates to your former time as Attorney General. If Britain leaves the, the European Union, are there specific implications for Ireland that the only other common law jurisdiction will have left Europe? Thank you. Um, I, don't, I don't believe so. I, I believe that we have been, and the United Kingdom has been, <coughs> in some areas of the Justice and Home Affairs portfolio, unduly defensive about the common law system and the implied suggestion that it is superior to the civil law processes. I, I, I just don't believe that. I'm not an expert on civil law procedures um, and so on. I'm not sure that a sort of defensive Western bulwark defending the um, common law system. In some places it should be defended, in others perhaps not. But I don't see that it should worry us. But maybe I'm missing a specific subject which uh, you know more about than I do. Uh, but my own view is I wouldn't worry about that at all. <clears throat> I think that there is a, a sort of a sense, you certainly get it in London, that the legal system here is so much superior to everyone else that uh, I'm not so sure that we can say the same about either there or here. Thank you very much. I want to thank, first of all, all of you for uh, coming earlier today and staying, which is very important. And I think that we were very well rewarded uh, for having stayed the day by the contribution from Peter Sutherland. And I want to thank him very warmly uh, for agreeing to speak here today and for uh, managing his personal arrangements so that he could be here. Um, he is a member of the Comité d'Honneur of the Institute. Uh, we are very privileged to have him as such. I'm very proud to work with him. Just say to, uh, say to him, um, as somebody who has fought, I think, something like 13 referenda campaigns uh, and uh, created three uh, civil society organizations in favor of a yes, that I just wish there were somebody like him in Britain who was championing the yes side. There isn't such a person, and I think this is its great um, weakness because it requires somebody with something in here very, very strongly beating. I think the passion with which you spoke, uh, Peter, uh, came across so honestly and so transparently and with such great force that uh, it could not but move your audience. I just wish there was somebody like that uh, in the UK at the moment. Uh, unfortunately, there isn't. Um, I just want to say one other thing about your comments, which uh, about the squaring of the circle. It's perfectly clear that there isn't any answer to, uh, the, to Britain's demands. On the one hand, the requirements of the treaties, on the other, and the national interests of all the other member states. There isn't. But you are right in saying that uh, there's a mentality in the United Kingdom at the moment, which on the, on the, uh, on the Brexit side, which uh, believes that there is. And it reminds me of that wonderful phrase that entered the English language that was actually in a penny, penny dreadful. Uh, where, as you know, at that time they, they had these serials which were appeared every week, written by different <coughs> authors uh, who uh, tried to make the matter almost impossible to solve for the guy who was writing the next series. And as you remember, the uh, famous one was the guy being tied to the railway track, shackled and weighed down with, with, with chains, and, all that, and the train was about 10 feet away from him at full speed. And he said, uh, well, let's see what happens to that next week. And as you remember, the opening line was, with one bound, Jack was free. <laughs> well, that mentality is working now. With one bound, Jack, would, would he, except that he won't. Um, I would hope, Peter, that you will uh, continue your work in the United Kingdom uh, to energize, motivate, and may I say, inspire uh, the side that is campaigning to keep Britain in the European Union for all of the reasons that you advanced. 
We're very grateful to you, and I hope that uh, the applause that you have received from the audience is the sort of recognition that, that you deserve. So thank you.